Well, we are going to look at uh, part three of Corona and the end times watch here. I, um, I want to just kind of put out a little disclaimer as we get going here that, guys, I, I don't know if, you know, we are in the end time. I mean, obviously we're in end times, but how close we are, I, I don't know. I, I'm just saying that there is a pattern that is coming here. There is a pattern with this white horse, a red horse, and then it's going to bring a black horse that we're going to talk about here today. And if that's the case, then I just want you to keep your eyes open. And so uh, I, I'm not saying, hey, we are right now, we've got the white horse going, we've got the red horse on its way. I don't know. All I'm saying is that we see things going on in our society right now that are fitting perfectly. But the way scripture works is a lot of times we see those patterns that have happened through history. There have been many antichrists. You know, Antiochus Epiphanes, even before Christ came, uh, certainly fit that description. We had the world falling apart, you know, in World War II. Hitler could have been easily an antichrist, um, a, a threat of uh, war. I, I think that what makes this one different is that the timing is right. There have been so many other prophecies of Israel becoming a nation and uh, the UN and things like that that are coming true that had not happened at the time of some of these other events. And so uh, we see the patterns of uh, the Jews kind of figured that there'd be around 6,000 years of history and then, you know, the Messiah would come back. And so there, there are just so many patterns and timings that seem to make this make sense. This is also something that's very unique. None of this makes sense. World War II, I, I know there were some illogical things that went on. You had your brown coats, you had things that's like, how could this happen? Um, and so it, I'm just saying that this is a worldwide event. It is defying logic, it's defying reason, and it's lining up with scripture. And so I don't want you thinking that I'm saying, all right, the, the horses have come. But I am saying it is a real possibility. And if that is the case, we're going to see that these horses, I don't even know how long of a period it will take to get all of these you know, four horses to come throughout these six seals, and then the seventh seal begins the trumpets. Um, I will say this, that uh, when we look at these horses, they, as I've talked about before, will build on one another. And so while we are in the black horse, that white horse has not gone away. It's still out. It's still released. And the red horse, which we've talked about being communism, we're definitely headed that direction, but it ha hasn't, you know, reached its goal. And so we have not finished that. But that red horse will indeed bring... Communism will bring what we're going to see here in this black horse. So let's begin, and uh, I'll probably give another disclaimer as we get on, because I'm just going to theorize a little bit here today, and just to have people have a watchful eye. That's it. That's what I want you to do, to, to do your own study, to do your own research. But 1 Peter 4, 7 says this, The end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be serious and watchful in your prayers. Now keep in mind, this was written 2,000 years ago. But at the same time, this is the attitude that we are to have. We are to be watchful in our prayers. We are to be serious. And at the very least, I'm hoping that these messages are shaking you a little bit and waking you up. Because urgency is a good thing for, for a, a human spirit. It keeps you focused on the Word and less focused on this world. So, you know, not so worried about the next concert that's coming up, the next rodeo, the next, uh, you know, sale, whatever the case might be that is distracting you from being focused on the reason we are here on this earth. And we also read here in 1 Thessalonians 5.1, But concerning the times and seasons, brethren, you have no need that I should write to you. 
For you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. Now, I know I've heard that quoted so many times. We've talked about it before. But just again, people always stop there. But verse 3 goes on, and it says, For when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman, and they shall not escape. And so, peace and safety. I would say, you know, everybody thinks America, they can't fall. Uh, we, we're, we're the most powerful. There's no way that America can fall. Well, there are times and there are seasons. He says, I don't need to write to you. You know perfectly that the day, the final end, is going to come like a thief in the night. And we think, oh, okay, so we don't know when it's going to happen. But as we continue the very next verse, verse 4, look what it says. But you brethren, you brothers, you Christians, you who read your Bible, you are not in darkness so that this day should overtake you as a thief. In other words, God has given us wisdom to understand that we are going to be able to understand the season that this is coming. He says, I don't need to write to you because you guys aren't in darkness. I don't need to tell you because the word is going to be your guide. And this is exactly what I'm seeing, guys. I'm seeing that those who are in the word, those who study their scriptures, those who have a relationship with Jesus are saying, something's going on. He says, you are all sons of light and sons of the day. We are not of the night, nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as others do, but let us watch and be sober. This is a call to the church to wake up, and that's what this message is supposed to do. It is supposed to keep you on your toes because you, brethren, are not to be in darkness. It is not to surprise you. And honestly, this is not surprising what we're seeing based on what Scripture says. And so he's not coming like a thief in the night to the believers. But yet I see many in the church who are sleeping. Maybe, maybe they've been going to church for the wrong reasons. Maybe, maybe they've been there for fire insurance or for social purposes, but they go to church on Sunday, and then the rest of the six days of the week, they hardly think about God. Oh, they might pray here and there, but really they're worldly. They're not doing what God has asked them to do. They're not obeying God. They're not, uh, you know, you probably couldn't pick them out of a lineup saying, hey, there's a Christian and there's not when they're at work because there's no difference between the world and the Christian today. That's wrong, and it shouldn't be that way. Revelation 6, 5, we're going to kind of start here, and you're going to see the black horse come. It says, when he opened the third seal, I heard the third living creature say, come and see. So I looked and behold, a black horse and he who sat on it had a pair of scales in his hand. Like I said, if this is the right interpretation that the white horse may have been released, the red horse we certainly see on the horizon. We see our country moving towards that direction, defunding the police, um, that's what's going to have to happen to bring in more of a, a, a United Nations world government. Then with that is going to come this black horse because, as I said, they build on one another. Well, we see this pair of scales in his hand. Biblically speaking, what we see scales is it was always uh, a measure of weighing, not you know, how much does your gold weigh? Now, sometimes, excuse me, sometimes it's used that way, but ultimately we see it used in Daniel um, when he had the dream, when the hand appeared on the wall and had that handwriting. Nobody could read it. Well, it basically meant, you know, to be weighed, to be measured, and to be judged. And this is the kind of thing that we're seeing here, is that there is um, a weighing of not judgment, but in a sense it is judgment on God, or from God, I should say, but rather it is a scale of weighing goods, selling, trading. 
And so in the context that we see it here, as you're going to see as we continue in these verses, it isn't about judgment like we see in Daniel, even though there may be judgment taking place because of this black horse. The picture that is seen is in trading and selling. And that is the where uh, we, we see uh, the scales used throughout Scripture many times. And so it's dealing with the economy. Now, again, as I said, the next verses are going to show that. Let me continue, verse 6. And I heard a voice in the midst of the, fl- uh, of the four living creatures saying, A quart of wheat for a denarius and three quarts of barley for a denarius, and do not harm the oil and the wine. So what is a denarius? Well, the Bible tells us that a denarius is a day's wage. So in other words, all you're getting for a full day's wage is a quart of wheat. That seems to be saying hyperinflation. Scholars that basically say what a day's wage was back then to compare to what a day's wage is today means that if a loaf of bread today costs about $3, at this um, change, you could look to be paying from $36 to $48 for a loaf of bread. That's the cheap stuff. If you get the $5 bread, $60 to $80 for a loaf of bread. Now, again, this might seem, how in the world could that happen? Well, that's what hyperinflation does. We've seen this throughout history as well, where people would, you know, in World War II, they, they would go and cash their check the moment they got it because they knew that tomorrow morning the price was going to be so much higher than it is right now. You just couldn't keep up with it. And this is what it's saying, is that our food, the necessities, are going to cost a tremendous amount of money. Can we see that happening, logically? Yeah, I I could see that happening with the, the direction the country is going right now. Let me just show you some headlines that kind of make it, to me, seem quite possible. Here's Rand Paul blasts imaginary money handouts wants of economic, that should be warns of economic calamity. Okay, so yeah, these handouts that have been gummed, the money that the government has been printing, if history is a, a, a teacher at all, we see that when countries do that, it does create hyperinflation. Here's another headline, Hawaii grapples with Great Depression level unemployment as tourism plummets. Or Here's another one, or I should say in that, that same article, it says the unemployment rate in uh, Kahuli, I'm, I'm sure I'm slaughtering that, the skyrocketed to 35% in April, nearly 10% higher than the national unemployment rate at the peak of the Great Depression. So the unemployment is 10% higher than it ever was during the time of the Great Depression, ABC News. Here's another headline, the Washington Sentinel. More than 40% of small businesses may close in the next six months. That was in May 4th. And we're already seeing a lot of this happening. Many restaurants haven't opened back up. CBS News, hit hard by layoffs. Everyone is shocked, says Hollywood Reporter. So even the news is being hit by these layoffs. And just virtually everybody, as you're going to see, here's another headline from uh, discern.com. 45.7 million Americans have now filed for unemployment since lockdowns began. Because there's only about 330 million people in the United States. Do the math. This is incredible. And this is only since the virus began. Taylor Borden. He says, the coronavirus outbreak has triggered unprecedented mass layoffs and furloughs. Here are the major companies that have announced that they are downsizing their workforce. In just 16 weeks, nearly 50 million Americans have filed for unemployment. That's more than the number of claims filed during the Great Recession. On July 9th, Bloomberg Law reported that Wells Fargo is preparing to cut thousands of jobs out of its 263,000 person workforce. 263,000 jobs from Wells Fargo. Now these aren't the, the little guys, these are the big guys. And it goes on, Walgreens 
said it plans to cut 4,000 jobs on July 9th and after reporting a 1.7 billion loss in the third quarter, while Macy's furloughed the majority of its workforce in March, it announced it would lay off about 3,900 corporate workers on June 25th. HSBC, Europe's biggest bank, announced plans to cut 35,000 jobs or 15% of its global workforce across the U.S. and Europe on June 17th. I mean, guys, Walgreens, Macy's, HSBC, these are not small companies. And by the way, these larger companies affect what goes on underneath them. There's a trickle effect. June 16th, a union representing AT&T employees said that the wireless carrier will lay off 3,400, shut down more than 250 stores. Chevron, the second largest oil producer in the U.S., announced it'll cut 10 to 15 percent of its 45,000 global workforce. Boeing said it would lay off nearly 7,000 employees on May 27th. The company initially announced that it would cut about 19 percent of its workforce on April 29th. The company had 143,000 workers at the beginning of the year. And they're going to cut up to 19%. Weeks after ride-hailing giant, Uber announced it is cutting 3,700 jobs, 14% of its workforce. The CEO announced on May 18th that he's going to cut 3,000 additional jobs and close 45 offices. So... I, I could give you story upon story upon story. Even locally, we can see stores, restaurants closing their doors, uh, all kinds of issues, because guys, things haven't gone back to normal. And if we're watching the news, they're not going to. Even though I believe there's really no reason for it not to go back to normal. I mean, go look at the statistics. The flu kills more people. And yet, we are more concerned and we're destroying the economy because of this. It makes no sense, which to me is one of those things that makes me say, maybe these are the horses that are being released. Um, Fox Business, basically, researchers say coronavirus locks down cost U.S. economy one trillion without saving many lives. So we even see that the statistics, as I said, are not, you know, uh, warranting what we are seeing going on out there. Something is not right. I think more and more people are beginning to realize that. I just don't see many of them tying this into the Bible and saying maybe it's time for judgment to begin. Maybe God is doing that. And I hear people saying, well, you know, no, God's going to bless America. Well, I, I'm going to come back to that later, but the bottom line is, is why would he? With the abortions, the homosexuality, the pornography, the strip clubs, all of these things that the church has been silent on and continues to grow rampant. Here's another headline from the Federalist. 100,000 businesses have permanently collapsed under the pandemic. 100,000 businesses. 30% of Americans didn't make their housing payment in June, says this headline. In the article, job losses remain at a catastrophic level that is unlike anything that we have ever seen before in all of U.S. history. 30% of the people did not make their housing payments. Think about that. That's the kind of situation that we're in right now. Here's Dennis Prager. He says, the worldwide lockdown, likely the greatest mistake in history. He says, the forcible prevention of America's, Americans from doing anything except what politicians deem essential has led to the worst economy in American history since the Great Depression of the 1930s. Okay, Revelation 6.6, 6, going back to that. Look what this is. I heard a voice in the midst of the four living creatures saying, a quart of wheat for a denarius, three quarts of barley for a denarius, and don't harm the oil and the wine. As I get back to these verses, and all these articles that I have just read to you, 
I don't know how you can't see that from a trillion dollar stimulus, not a billion, trillion dollar stimulus package, that we can't see the handwriting on the wall that these headlines aren't skewed. That these headlines don't point us to the very real possibility that this horse is coming. Let me show you what uh, Lenin, you remember communist Lenin, right? Let me show you what he said. Vladimir, Vladimir Lenin said, the surest way to overthrow an existing social order is to debauch the currency. This is the real reason our presses are printing rubles, ruble bills day and night without rest. See, they weren't printing to help the people, they were printing to accomplish an agenda of overthrowing the existing social order. Is it possible that that's what's going on in our country right now? If history is a good teacher, then we better be good students and pay attention. But what I'm seeing is the, the black horse is being set up. And what brings it about? A change of the social order. The red horse. Bringing in communism. Leviticus 26.26 26 says, When I have cut off your supply of bread, ten women shall bake your bread in one oven, and they shall bring back your bread by weight, and you shall eat and not be satisfied. The reason I'm taking you here is I want you to see from the Bible that this is kind of a standard that we see. That when God brings judgment... He talks about eating bread by weight. What did Revelation 6 tell us? That a quart of wheat, our bread, will cost a day's wages. That it's going to be weighted. And here is exactly what we see in Leviticus 26 when he's talking about judgment. When I come to bring judgment, you are going to bring back your bread by weight. Let me give you another example. Again, this pattern in Scripture, Ezekiel 4, verse 16. Moreover, he said to me, Son of man, surely I will cut off the supply of bread in Jerusalem. Okay, judgment. And he says, They shall eat bread by weight and with anxiety, and they shall drink water by measure and with dread. So, again, is there any reason God should bring judgment on this country? The abortion, homosexuality, sex trafficking, Jeffrey Epstein, all of the political corruption, all of the Hollywood corruption, and the liberal churches. And by the way, most of the people in the churches supporting what Hollywood does, watching those rated R filthy shows. Okay, Yes, there is reason that God would bring judgment. But what I'm hearing is so many people in the church saying, oh, but you know what, the dollar, this could bring the dollar back and we're going to be stronger than ever. Why? Why would God bless America? I don't mean to sound un, um, uh, grateful or uh, appreciative of what our country does, unpatriotic, but guys, you have to live in reality, not live in hope of what you want. Because I'll tell you something. Uh, I've done this message before with, with Jeremiah and Hananiah. You go and you see Jeremiah's prophesying and saying, Listen, guys, your country is about to fall. The Babylonians are coming. You are going to lose your stuff and you are going to lose your freedom. And the false prophets, they come in and say, No, Jeremiah, you are wrong. And they sound like prophets. They sound like they're believers. They sound like they're Christians. And you know what? Everybody buys it because they give them a message of hope for their stuff and their freedom. And he says, no, Babylon is going to go back home and you're going to be stronger than ever. This is the message that I'm hearing coming from many churches, many so-called prophetic ministries that are out there. Guys, I, in my spirit, I, I believe these are false prophets. They're telling you what you want. Because again, you go and look at the MO throughout Scripture. Every time there is judgment that begins, you will see that God also raises up or allows these false prophets to rise up. And the false prophets always give a message of hope. You know, Pastor Dana Coverstone had a dream that warns us about September and November, some things coming. And there have been many prophetic ministries who have kind of 
disagreed with his prophecy. And I've listened to them, and I have to say, I don't understand the disagreement. And he says, well, you know, first of all, there wasn't really a message of hope. It instilled fear. Well, guys, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Now, I didn't see Dana trying to freak you out. Actually, I saw him telling you, listen, be wise, be prepared, but you better be praying. We as a church need to unite, and we need to be fasting and praying and coming together and refocusing our life on God, on Jesus. But these other people saying, well, it, it instills fear and it doesn't give hope. Well, that's exactly what false prophets do. They want to rob you of the fear of God. They want to rob you of waking up and being, living in reality. And they want you to live in the hope of my stuff, the hope of my freedom. Well, guys, I'll tell you, you read the book of Revelation, I can tell you whether this is you know, the seals that we're experiencing now or not, when they happen, there is not going to be hope of your freedom and hope of your stuff. Revelation 6.6 6 here, talking about a quart of wheat costing a day's wages, that doesn't bring hope for me in my life on the material level. But in the spiritual level, it does. You know why? Because it tells me that the Lord is coming back. And when he comes back, that is a good thing for us. Oh, there might be some trials, but it means I'm going to be able to be with the Lord someday soon. That's hope. I also know that God is going to be there for me. Even if I'm being stoned to death, he's going to be there for me, giving me peace and joy and hope. I see that example all throughout not only history, but scripture. Stephen, while he was being stoned, he saw heaven opened. He had peace as he was dying. We can see uh, so many godly men of the past. If you look at the martyrs that had peace, uh, the name's escaping me, but that 86-year-old man who it was being burned at the stake, and he says, you know, 80 and 6 years I've served my Lord. I'm not about to turn my back on him now. Light the flames. That's the hope. That's the joy. That's the, the foundation we stand on. And so, I'll be honest, I'm not going to be listening to these prophetic people who are trying to give us a physical hope, a material hope. I'm going to listen to those who point us to Jesus and say, though the Babylonians are coming, God is going to be with you. Now, get on your knees and pray and seek him while he may be found, because when the flood waters rise, you won't find him. By the way, that's a paraphrase of Scripture. Going back here one more time to Revelation 6.6. 6 quart of wheat for a denarius, three quarts of barley for a denarius. We're seeing that this is what is supposed to happen. You know, historically, God says this is going to happen. That's what I mean by that. So if we see this happening, if we see hyperinflation take place, it's not the first time throughout history it has happened, but I would hope that it's going to make you listen. Because God is trying to tell you something. You see, wheat and barley back then, these are staple foods. The, these are the things that you need. Not just your desires, but your needs. Well, you know, back in 1973, David Wilkerson, I would have considered him a mentor, a mentor that I didn't necessarily know personally, but one whose messages were spot on and I would read his newsletters that would come out every time and, and listen to some of his messages and, and never once did I find anything that I really disagreed with. Well he had a vision back in 1973 and uh, just like normal you know everybody kinda there's some people who criticized him for that and so on <clears throat> but I believe they were false prophets because David Wilkerson's dream, his vision, everything has happened except for a final little bit that lines up exactly with what, you know, this uh, Pastor Dana Cornerstone, what, what he saw happening here in September and November. He saw economic collapse. And he said no one would be unscathed. 
He saw famines. He saw fires. New York City, Washington, D.C., thousands of fires burning. Well, that lines up not only with Scripture, but it lines up with Pastor Dana's dream. And I, again, don't know if we are in that time for sure. All I'm saying is the handwriting does seem to be on the wall. And if this isn't making you get to church, be singing and praising God more than you ever have, to be in your word more than you ever have, then I think you are going to be one of those who when the time comes, you're going to have a hard time finding the Lord. Because, guys, you can't even come to know Jesus unless the Father draws you. Part of what's going to happen in the last hour, as we saw in those parables, that the workers go out and you hire some at the first hour and the sixth hour and so on, and all of these people are hired, and then finally at the last hour, nobody is hired. Because you see, there's going to come a time when God is not going to continue to offer you the gift of salvation. It is too late. Don't wait for that day. I hope that you can see the handwriting on the wall and it makes you wake up and it makes you repent of your sins. And if you're stuck in pornography right now, then I'll tell you something. You're not going to get to know the Lord real well if all you're th thinking about in your mind is how to please your flesh. You had better repent and you better realize that you are on a path of destruction. And you, not, you need to start filling your mind with the word of God. And every time you have a lustful thought, you better run to the Lord. You better get down on your knees in prayer. You better go and confess your sins to some people so that they can hold you accountable. You need to get serious about your soul. I want to show you, going back to some headlines here, Tyson Foods, the Daily Caller News Foundation by Chris White says, Tyson Foods rolled out a full-page advertisement Sunday in the Washington Post and the New York Times warning that the country's food supply chain is breaking amid continued lockdowns aimed at slowing down the coronavirus pandemic. Okay, again, slowing down what? The flu. Okay, again, I'm not saying there isn't a virus, and I'm not saying that people will die, just like there is a flu virus, just like people will die because of it. But, look what's happening because of it. Okay, uh, the food chain, the food supply chain is breaking. It continues, and it says one of the thousands, or I'm sorry, Dennis Prager here, one of the thousands of unpaid garment workers protesting the lockdown in Bangladesh understands the situation better than almost any health official in the world. We're starving. If we don't have food in our stomach, what's the use of observing this lockdown? But concern for the Bangladeshi worker among the world's elites seems non-existent. He continues, according to the WFP director David Beasley on April 21st, we could be looking at a famine in about three dozen countries. There's also a real danger that more people could potentially die from the economic impact of COVID-19 than from the virus itself. The lockdown is possibly even more catastrophic than the virus in its outcome. The collapse of global food supply systems and widespread human starvation. Dennis Prager. News at yahoo.com, rotting food, hungry masses, chaotic su supply chains, coronavirus upends the U.S. food system. In less time it takes a farmer to plant and harvest a head of lettuce, the nation's entire food industry has been flipped on its head by the COVID-19 pandemic. An intricate system for matching supply with demand established over decades has been thrown out of whack, just as unemployment and food insecurity are skyrocketing among families. Guys, how in the world can you not see what's going on? That the supply chain, something that's taken decades to, to, to build up, has been destroyed in just a matter of a few weeks. And it's going to bring what? Starvation, famines. That's what these people are writing. That's what they're predicting. And this is exactly what Scripture says is supposed to happen with 
the black horse, the third seal. And the coin shortage that's been going on. You know, Pastor Dana basically predicted that. Now, there were some things that could indicate that it was coming even before he, he said that. But again, then that's assuming that he's lying and he's making this stuff up. He'd be insane to make this up, to be so specific, especially about times, because then in a matter of two, three months, the guy is, nobody's going to listen to him. You see, I, I believe this coin shortage, okay, this is just my opinion based on some things that I know. I know somebody who has a friend who works for the Federal Reserve. And they told me that they were sa they said, we are told to let everybody know that everything's fine. There's nothing to worry about. But they're not minting new coins. Well, that doesn't make any sense. If we're at such a shortage, they should be printing these things out right and left. But yet, I remember even a year ago, going to our Wells Fargo, one of the main banks, and do you know that they were no longer accepting coins? If you had a, a, a cordage of coins, you couldn't take it to your bank anymore. Why? I don't know. I kind of think that there's something going on that the government knows about, not to sound all conspiratorial, but that they know about, but yet we are just being lemon, lemmings and going along with what they say. I think there's a reason for this, this coin shortage, and that is they know that hyperinflation is going to come because things are going to fall. Now, I'm going to show you here, just again, this food thing. Farmers, do you know the share of food in dollars during the pandemic. Look what's happened. Back in January, a gallon of milk cost $3.25. In April, $3.21. Now, back in January, when it was three twenty-five, a farmer got a dollar fifty-one out of that. That means 46% went to the farmer. In April, even though it had gone down four cents, the farmer's price was a dollar four or just thirty two percent. So they're sharing the brunt, or not I shouldn't say sharing, they're taking the brunt. The same thing we could look at things like bacon. In January they got fifteen percent, in June eleven percent, even though the price went up, you know, over twenty five cents. A steak. A steak went from five ninety six to seven thirty nine from January to June. The farmers used to get 50% of that, now they get 34%. So we can see that things just aren't adding up. Why are the farmers having to pay? Because the farmers are going to go bankrupt as well. Look at here. China orders Christians to take down images of Jesus from their homes. And my question is, is this coming here? It says, there are fears that China's new social credit system designed to reward good citizenship and punish bad will be used to discriminate against Christians, wrote the Catholic Charity. The fears are tied to cash rewards for those who inform on the underground churches and other unofficial places of worship. In other words, you get rewarded for informing on your neighbors. In April, for instance, party officials visited the homes of Christians in the northern province, ordering that those who received welfare payments from government to remove crosses, Christian symbols, and images in their homes and replace them with portraits of Chinese communist leaders. The officials threatened the Christians that non-compliance with the order would result in suspension of their welfare subsidies. Guys, unless you wear a mask, unless you get a vaccine, unless you support the new Marxist ideology supported by Black Lives Matters, if that's a surprise, go watch part two, then you're not going to get help. I can easily see, hey, if you don't have this mandatory vaccine and prove you have it, you're not welcome in our store. You can't buy. You can't rely on the government. You see, we have to rely on God because governments always have been corrupt. There's always been corruption in government. Even when ours began, there was corruption. That's just the way it is. Don't be surprised if someday, guys, you're going to say, no, you can't display that cross in your home because if you do, you're not getting this money 
that you know this welfare this this government handout that you need to survive I want to show you here this uh, little clip here from face the nation watch this among the many disturbing pictures that we've become accustomed to seeing since the pandemic started are those of people seeking help feeding their families the lines at food banks have been shocking. The numbers are two. In April, more than one in five U.S. households reported not having sufficient resources to buy food. That number increased to two in five households, 41% for mothers with children 12 and under. We go now to Dallas and Claire Babineau Fontenot. She is the CEO of Feeding America, the nation's largest hunger relief organization. Good morning to you. Good morning. We've heard the statistics in terms of who is most vulnerable and how hard they are getting hit. We also know that food prices had their biggest spike uh, in decades just last month. This seems like the perfect storm. Uh, what are you seeing at your facilities right now? Who is coming and what do they need? Well, Margaret, I think you used the right term. It is, in fact, the perfect storm. We're seeing a marked increase in demand um, to the tune of, on average, 60% more people showing up in need of our services. Um, and at the, at the time that we're having that increase in demand, we have a decrease in donations, we have an increase in cost of food, and we have a decrease in volunteers. So it is, in fact, a perfect storm. How so are many of the people who are coming? Oh, I'm so sorry. Yes, please no, go. please. So how are you managing that? And, and is is the person that you are serving now, as challenging as it is, different from what you saw just a few months ago? Is it a different demographic? Yeah, that's exactly what I was going to say, that 40% on average of the people that we're seeing now um, have never relied upon the charitable food system before now. So we're definitely seeing different people showing up. So many of the people who are there, they're kind of familiar to us. Some of the people who were donors are now in line in need of our services. So there's been a change. Uh, to be sure, uh, but 60% increase. And people who used to be donors are the ones that are now coming. Guys, we're talking about food here. Again, this is exactly what the black horse is all about. Now, I also want to touch on this do not harm the oil and the wine. What does that mean? Well, I've always understood it to basically mean this. The necessities, like your bread, your wheat, you won't be able to afford that, but the, the oil and the wine, there'll be plenty of that. Because you don't really need it, and so there's not going to be a demand for it, and therefore the prices of those things are not going to increase. It'll be cheaper to have those things. Now, history... If uh, that teaches us anything again, in 92 AD we see Domitian, uh, the Roman emperor. Uh, he had put out an edict that, because there was a famine going on at the time, that he had ruled that the farmers and everybody, they were supposed to destroy their vineyards, pull them up, you know, just destroy it, so that that land could be used for food, you know, to, to plant good food that you needed. But the people refused to do it. They rebelled against the edict so that they could keep their oil and wine. And so, again, that would further the famine, but it might be one of those things as well, like I said, that uh, you're not going to see the oil and wine increase because those are the things that don't matter as much. What's going to increase are the necessities. Um, Proverbs 21 verse 17 says this too, He who loves pleasure will be a poor man, but he who loves wine and oil will not be rich. You see, biblically, wine and oil are those things that indicate pleasure, that indicate the uh, maybe the more rich, the, the things that the rich people get. Now, here it's saying if you love those things, if, if you love pleasure, you're, if you're lazy, you're never going to be rich. But I think there's also a spiritual connection here too, that if you love this world, the things that this world has to offer, you will never be spiritually rich. You're never going to gain heaven. Okay? Remember Jesus said it was harder for a rich man to get into heaven than for a camel to go through an eye of a needle. 
And he says, with man, this is impossible, but with God, all things are possible. But just showing that we have to have our eyes on Jesus, not the things of this world. But I think it means that people will still not repent. That they are going to continue to seek pleasure. They're going to continue to seek their oil and wine. Don't touch my oil and wine. I am fine rather than humble themselves and repent. And guys, this is exactly what I'm seeing happening in our world right now. I'm seeing so many Christians, when we talk about the possibility of these seals coming, that maybe we are in them, they're like, I don't want to hear about that. We want to just put on our blinders, we want to live our life the way we always have, and we want to ignore the reality that's right in front of us so that we can go drink our wine and oil that we can ex experience the pleasures of this life. That if I pretend it's not happening, maybe it won't happen. That's what I'm possibly seeing going on here. Again, I, I don't know for sure, but I'm saying I think people, rather than repenting, don't touch the oil and oil, don't touch my fun, they will not repent. They will not prepare. They will not begin to pray and fast. They're not going to get down on their knees. They're going to live their lives just like they always have, even though the world is falling apart around them. Even though bread is going to cost, you know, $50, they're going to be saying, oh, but I'm still going to live the, my life the way I'm going to pretend. I'm going to give myself the pleasures I deserve. Psalm 116, verse 12 says, What shall I render to the Lord for all his benefits towards me? In other words, what should I do to repay the Lord for what he's done for me? Verse 13, I will take up the cup of salvation and call upon the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows to the Lord now in the presence of all his people. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. You see, rather than seeking the pleasures of this life, I think you should really meditate upon this. What should you do because Jesus has died on the cross for you? You should take up the cup of salvation. You should be calling on the name of the Lord and paying your vows to the Lord. What's that mean? Obey Him. You obey Him in the presence of all the people. I don't think it's an accident that it seems to just all of a sudden switch gears and verse 15 seems like it doesn't even belong in this. Okay, what shall I do to repay God for everything he's done for me? Well, I should, you know, lift up the cup of salvation. I should be loving the Lord. And then precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. Because what I think this is talking about is this. What should you do to repay God for everything he's done? You should be going and doing your job and spreading the gospel. And when you do that, you're going to be hated. You're going to be living a, a life not for you, for the oil and the wine, but for God. And you're going to be obeying Him. And you know what? When you do that, it is precious when you die. You don't need to be afraid of death. It's a good thing. It's a precious thing. It's wonderful because we don't really die. We just change locations. We go to be with Him in heaven. Consider that. Psalm 58, verses 10 and 11, The righteous shall rejoice when he sees the vengeance. He shall wash his feet in the blood of the wicked, so that men will say, Surely there is a reward for the righteous. Surely he is God who judges in the earth. See, guys, we need to recognize God is in charge. Wickedness is going on and always will go on in not only this country, but every country. But I'll tell you something, that wickedness will be avenged. The righteous shall rejoice when he sees the vengeance of God. Guys, if what we're seeing going on in this country are the, the, the seals, the horses, then that means we are now upon the judgment of God. Judgment is coming upon this country. And rather than you as a Christian being, oh no, what am I supposed to do? Maybe you ought to be rejoicing. The righteous shall rejoice when he sees the vengeance. You see, we have hope. Ironically, I, I have more hope than I probably have had in years. I am at peace. I am at comfort. I am not scared. Even though I know hard times may be ahead, 
I'm rejoicing because this is a good thing. I want you to understand something, guys. Justice is a good thing if you're on the right side of the law. Okay, if somebody has wronged you, it is a good thing to go before the judge because that judge is going to rule in your favor. And this is why we as Christians, those who are walking with God, can stand rejoicing and in peace and in hope because, guys, when I stand before my judge, because of Yeshua Jesus, I have nothing to be afraid of. I have nothing to worry about because that judge is going to rule in my favor because of Jesus. If you don't know Jesus, though, yeah, you better be scared and you better be preparing your heart because I'm telling you, it is possible that last hour is about to come and it'll be too late you will not be able to repent of your sins anymore. And by the way, that is exactly what we see in the book of Revelation. They cannot, even though all the terrible things are happening on this earth, it says, and still they refused to repent. Are you going to be one of those that's so focused on this world, so focused on the wine and the oil, that you're going to be one of those that when judged, you will be found wanting? Psalm 50, verse 3, Our God shall come and shall not keep silent. A fire shall devour before him. Maybe we're there. Maybe that's what's coming. And it shall be very temptuous all around him. It's going to be terrible. The world's falling apart. Verse 4, He shall call to the heavens from above and to the earth that he may judge his people. Gather my saints together to me, those who have made a covenant with me by sacrifice. By sacrifice. Okay, I think ultimately this means that they made a covenant with God by the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. But I also think there's the meaning of this, that when you believe on Jesus Christ, that means that you live your life sacrificially. You don't leave, live it for you and to try and, you know, the man who dies with the most toys wins. No, they lose Verse 6, let the heavens declare his righteousness, for God himself is judge. Guys, God is coming to, uh, to judge with fire, to avenge those who have not only re rejected him, but who have gone after his own. And his wrath is going to be on the ungodly, not me. Not the believers, not the saints. He says, gather my saints together to me. So he's coming with fire. There will be judgment, but guess what? For us who are believers, for us who are following after God, we have hope. We have joy. We should be rejoicing. We should be praying, come, Lord Jesus, come. You know, if you listen to my Hebrew study, you'll see not many weeks ago, we talked about, uh, maybe in part 14, 15, 16, somewhere there, do not pray for these people. When the Babylonians were coming, and Jeremiah was prophesying truth, saying, hey, you're going to lose your stuff, and you're going to lose your freedom, and the false prophets are saying, no, everything's going to be fine, your dollar's going to be better than it ever was before. What happens? Well, we see that God tells Jeremiah, do not pray for these people. You can pray for them to repent, but don't pray for their good. Don't pray for them to be blessed anymore. Maybe we're here in this country at that point. That the church is so filled with compromise, a tainted gospel, a gospel that's not even a gospel anymore, that maybe we shouldn't be praying for them to be blessed, but that God would come so that we could rejoice and that he would gather us to be with him. Well, guys, uh, I decided to, to make this a, a part two, uh, which I, I should say really a part four, um, because it, it was just too long. And so I'm going to make this a part three and a part four. And so I kind of stopped. I'm going to stop this one here and... Um, basically let you pick up watching the next part to kind of put these things together at that point.